Genesis chapter 4 reads as a sort of adventure story. It's a story that's complete with kings and the joining of forces and armies. It's, it has battles and kidnappings and counterattacks and the spoils of war and just everything that goes along with those sorts of events. But there's a brief three-verse interlude in the predominant narrative that should grab our attention. For it's in these verses, or it's on these verses, that the Bible later comments. And it's these three verses that ultimately point us most clearly to the glory of Jesus Christ. Let me show you what I mean. At this time, the land of Canaan was ruled by what are described as kings. We can better understand them as sort of tribal leaders or the rulers of small city-states. They were powerful, they were important, but not quite kings according to the more modern imagination. As has been the case throughout history, their existence was not always peaceful. If they wanted something, something that belonged to somebody else or to another king, and they believed that they were powerful enough to take it, well, quite often they would. And that's what's taking place in our text. There's a group of four kings that ultimately does battle against a group of five kings. In the second group, this group of five kings, belong the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that, of course, is relevant for us because if you remember, Abram's nephew Lot lived in Sodom. And thus, he's likely part of the king of Sodom's army. So when the group of five kings was defeated, many of the soldiers, including Lot, were taken captive and their possessions were plundered. When Abram hears about this, he gathers his able-bodied men, a um, number over 300, and chases this group of four kings. After journeying like 100 miles or so, they finally catch them, and by the grace of God, they defeat them. And in doing so, they rescue Lot, and they redeem all of this stolen property. Upon Abram's return, the king of Sodom comes out to meet him. This king is followed by another king, a man named Melchizedek. And it is Melchizedek that should capture our attention as we read this text. So a few things uh, about Melchizedek. Notice first his name. His name means righteous king. Second, see that he is the king of Salem, the city that would become known as Jerusalem. And Salem means peace. Thus Melchizedek is rightly called the king of peace. Third, he's described as a priest. Fourth, his importance is demonstrated by the fact that the king of Sodom actually defers to him, as does Abram. Additionally, Abram acknowledges his greatness by giving him a tithe, that is a tenth of all that he had. Lastly, he is not described according to his genealogy or his geography. And it is this last point that the author of Hebrews seizes upon, saying that in this way he, quote, resembles the Son of God, and that he, quote, continues as a priest forever. Now, here's the point of all of this. And the book of Hebrews makes this uh, clear. It, it takes the historical figure Melchizedek and presents him as a picture or, or a type of Jesus. And think about this. Jesus, who is the perfect priest king. Jesus, who is the only one who is truly without beginning or end. Jesus, the one who conquers and justice, blesses eternally, is rightly known as the Prince of Peace. Jesus, who will forever reign in the new Jerusalem and is the one to whom all will ultimately defer. Hebrews chapter 7 applies all of these truths, saying, quote, Consequently, he, that's Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Melchizedek was good, but Jesus is better. Better because he reconciles his followers to God and then continues to work for their good and for their purity. The application of all of this, of course, is that we should honor Jesus to a greater extent than Abram honored Melchizedek. And the way that we do this is through faith, by believing, confessing, and following. And so as you read Genesis chapter 14 today, know that Melchizedek, as good as he is, ultimately should point us to Jesus, the greater king.